about 7 to 10 percent of individuals between 40 and 60 years of age suffer from lateral elbow tendinopathy. This percentage can rise to 30 percent when occupations with a high hand or wrist demands are considered. About 20 to 35 percent of people have incomplete resolution or recurrence between 6 and 12 months after onset. We need to do better. You are here to learn how. Download the free PhysioTutors app now and become the best clinician you can be. Hi and welcome back to PhysioTutors. Let's clear something up first. Lateral epicondylalgia, lateral epicondylitis, tendinitis or tendinosis, a tennis elbow or lateral elbow tendinopathy are all basically the same diagnosis. The authors use the term lateral elbow tendinopathy, which will be used in this video as well. Lateral elbow tendinopathy is located on the common extensor tendon with the extensor carpi radialis brevis and digitorum most often affected. They are caused by a combination of structural, cellular and chemical alterations. Interestingly, we cannot make any deductions on the histological nature of the patient's tendon clinically. We should rather monitor irritability as a substitute. Let's get into the risk factors. We've got modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. The names speak for themselves. Non-modifiable ones are the female sex, smoking history, rotator cuff injuries, the Kervain's disease, carpal tunnel syndrome, and oral corticosteroid use. As a side note, check out our carpal tunnel syndrome guideline video or our rotator cuff guideline video if you want to know more about it. Modifiable risk factors include low job control, low social support, handling tools over 20 kilograms, and repetitive elbow or wrist use. An unknown fact is that a twin study pointed out that heritability is about 40%. Patients want to know what to expect. The guidelines note that more than 55% of patients report persisting symptoms more than two years after onset. This is in contrast with Econ et al. in 2021 that stated that 90% of patients achieve a resolution of symptoms after one year. If your patient complains of high baseline disability, is female and has self-reported nerve symptoms, she'll have a worse prognosis for the coming eight weeks of treatment. Predicting long-term outcomes, however, is harder due to its multifactorial nature. After all this background information, you're probably wondering how to diagnose the condition. And it's actually pretty easy. Your patient will report pain on local palpation, resisted wrist or digit extension, and elongation of the long wrist extensors. The diffuse character of the complaint might be due to diffusing of the tendons with the lateral collateral ligament, the joint capsule, and the annular ligament. This diffuse character, however, does make the diagnosis a bit more difficult. Other pathologies will have a similar pain distribution, so excluding those is crucial for a confident diagnosis. The most common examples are cervical radiculopathy, radial tunnel syndrome, posterior interosseous syndrome, plica syndrome, radiocapitalar chondromalacia, posterolateral rotatory instability, and myofascial trigger points in the wrist extensors. The guideline committee advises clinicians to classify their patients into groups. For those with severe pain, type 3 distribution, and high disability, the focus of treatment can be symptom modulation. With mild pain, type 1 or type 2 distribution, and low disability, loading the wrist extensors can be done. Seeing that these categories are fluid is important. Before we go into treatment, you should know that the guidelines recommend using the PRTEE and DASH questionnaires to assess baseline scores and treatment progression and to assess irritability. If your patient has highly physically demanding activities, the patient-specific functioning scale can be used to assess progress on this. Here you can see other measures to include. This all boils down to eventually treating your patient. Due to a plethora of different interventions, I will only get into strong and moderate evidence, meaning the must or should do's. Some clinicians think that specific exercises, such as eccentrics, are superior. However, evidence suggests that isometric, concentric, and eccentric therapeutic resisted exercises of the wrist extensors can all be used. The wrist strengthening activities are recommended to be performed in conjunction with other modalities like manual therapy. 
These exercise recommendations are made for subacute or chronic complaints, not acute ones. Manipulation or mobilization techniques should be used to reduce pain and increase pain-free grip strength in the short term if tolerated by the individual. Next, and this is a first, tendon or trigger point dry needling is recommended for pain and functional deficits. In patients with irritable tendons, you could use rigid taping techniques for immediate short-term pain relief and improvement in pain-free muscle function. If you want to see a practical example of management, click on our case study in the upper right corner. If you want to learn more about tennis elbows, check out our online course by Andrew Cuff and Thomas Mitchell. Make sure to give the package discount a look to get the shoulder, elbow, wrist and hand all in one purchase. The links are in the video description. I am Max for Physio Tutors and I will see you in another video. Bye.